friendly welcome. Uh, Leon and I have uh, been involved in a number of adventures at various times. Yeah, that's right. When, when I smashed the Nelson Mandela statue, Leon was, part, <laughs> Leon was part of the team that did it. It was an outrage. Nelson Mandela, that was before Mandela ever became president of South Africa. He was doing a lifetime prison sentence for acts of terrorism. He was, he was the moral godfather behind terrorists putting bombs in railway stations. <coughs> and, that, and that the powers that be in Britain should erect a statue to a terrorist. And I'll tell you in whose name, who, who organised the putting of that statue of a terrorist in the centre of London. That was the, the left-wing mayor of London, Ken Livingstone, in combination with Margaret Thatcher's government. The two did that together. And when the statue was unveiled, there was Ken Livingstone, and Margaret Thatcher sent down a, a woman um, government minister called Mrs. Linda Chalkley, who was a, who was a minister of overseas aid. So she represented um, Maggie Thatcher's government, and Ken Livingstone was there to represent the Labour Party and was mayor of London at the time. Look. Terrorism is one of the wickedest crimes going, putting bombs in railways is a wicked thing. And that a statue should be put in London. There's two now. There's now two. There's two. Yeah. Nelson Mandela's got one um, by Hungerford Bridge where the Charing Cross comes out and goes to Waterloo East and goes out towards Kent. You've got one by the railway line there on the South Bank in front of the Queen Elizabeth II um, Conference Hall. And you've now got a second one in Parliament Square. The only individual, the only personage, I wouldn't say man, well I was about to say man, the only personage, <laughs> the only personage who's got two statues in our capital, a terrorist who put bombs. I could, wickedness, wickedness. So Liam and I and another chap, we did some symbolic damage, we bashed it. Yeah. I'll tell you a bit more, I'll tell you a bit more. Um, it was actually bashed a load of times, I'm not going to say who bashed it a load of times, but on one occasion they were, they were clearly determined to get whoever's doing this, and we were bashing it. And behind it, the security guards, I don't know what I'm talking about all this, I just carry on, a, a, a walk down memory lane, a walk down memory lane. The security guards in the Queen Elizabeth II conference hall kept turning the lights on and off, on and off, to drive us away. But they'd done that before and it hadn't had much. Anyway, bash it, we thought, it's taken a long time for the police to come. It's taken a long time. We really are, you know, working hard here and working up a sweat. In the end, the trains, which the early morning trains would come past at half past four in the morning, going into Charing Cross. All looked down at these guys. Anyway, we realised, why it took so long for Britain's or London's finest to arrive on the scene of this obvious crime. Because the South Bank complex is huge and they'd obviously got, we found out, police cars on every exit. And then three coppers came along and they walked so slowly towards us. And I thought, <laughs> why are they walking slowly? Because we were running as fast as we could. And they were driving us towards the other police cars. And we all split up in different directions and we all joined Lectron at the same police station. When, when it came to <coughs> The case at Croydon Crown Court, <coughs> unlike, um, unlike the grim tales we've been hearing um, nowadays, listen, what happened to us, the way we were treated in the 1980s, is not the way we're treated now. And I'm not recommending this, I'm just walking down uh, memory lane with you. But when we, turned, when we eventually, through all the judicial process, ended up at um, Croydon Crown Court, I'm not going to give the name here, I'm not going to give any names, but the, the judge <coughs> was a, it's a bit hard to tell looking at them because they wear these wigs, but she was a middle-aged woman, and I think that she was absolutely amused by us, to see us three standing in her dock. And she heard all the, all the rigmarole, and she, um, you see, we were a bit clever. When we went through the, um, the, the whole system, we ended up at one stage in a magistrate's court, and this clear left-winger said to us, let's deal with it down, because he could have given us three months in jail. But I knew that we'd go to jail if we, we, we pleaded. So we, went, we took a risk and ended up in a Crown Court, where they could have given us much heavier sentence. But we took a risk, we went into the court, and she said to us, how do you plead? So we all said, guilty, 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 because we didn't feel the least bit ashamed of what we'd done. Mm. Not at all. Smashing, doing some symbolic damage to a statue of a terrorist. We were seen doing it, so there was no killing. We were seen doing it, the police got us, blah, blah, blah. Anyway, she went out, you're pleading guilty, all pleading guilty. She went out the room, powdered her nose or whatever they do out there, came back, she gave us a little lecture. She said, you're not to go around smashing statues. <laughs> Naughty boys! You're not to do that. Some people like these statues. And then exercising her powers as a, as a British judge, with us in the, in the dock waiting for the axe to come on the back of our neck, she said, it will be a custodial sentence. And for dramatic effect, she let that hang in the air. And then she said, it'll be suspended. Well, and she looked at us and said, you can go now. <laughs> you didn't have to say that a second time. Anyway, Liam was, Liam was part of the team. So anyway, um, I don't know how long ago, it was a long time ago, 1980 sometime. Um, but anyway, um, I've been invited here to speak about UKIP. Um, I must say, it was very grim what we heard uh, Steve Frost say. Look, all I say is be very, very careful. 
We are the last chance for the white race. Be very careful. Don't break the law. Don't be provocative. Walk the other way. Because we are here to survive. I once, I've served on the National Front Directorate. I'm not going to mention any names here. But the chairman of the National Front once had an argument with one of the other leading members, whose name I'm not going to mention. It wasn't Andrew, though. Um, and this argument took an interesting form. One of the leading personalities, a strong man with a strong personality, said, we in the National Front are here to fight. And John Tyndall, who happened to be chairman, said, no, wrong. And of course, our heads practically span off our heads. He said, we're here to win. That's a subtle difference, though. Mm. We're here to win. So no more, no more <coughs> bashing statues in the middle of the night, because in this age, it's entirely different. It's getting very serious now, very, very serious. Um, and I must say, I'm going to talk about here, we've heard ideology from the earlier two speakers. We've had ideology, we've had uh, religion, we've had philosophy. Um, I'm going to talk about the, the nitty gritty of the coming general election, um, the more grubbier part of politics, but real for all of us. And I'm going to say to you what you know already, that at this coming general election, um, UKIP is going to ride very, very high. It's going to be a very strong presence at the general election. Um, how many votes UKIP will get, and whether, yes or no, um, UKIP will get um, um, MPs elected, we will find out in May, but at the moment we don't know. But um, clearly, clearly, speaking amongst ourselves, clearly UKIP at the general election will eclipse any performance that our type of nationalists um, are going to put into that general election. Um, that's clearly going to happen, and so that will pres that certainly presents a challenge to us. Um, and I will say to you that, with regard to the challenge of the fact that UKIP is going to do very well at this election and will eclipse whatever we may or may not do at the, at the parliamentary election, that I will say to you, if we keep our nerve and if we um, maintain discipline, which is the most important thing of all in this business, maintaining discipline and um, use our God-given brains, then I. I'm sure that we can ride, ride on UKIP. <coughs> um, it's clear that at the coming general election, UKIP will get millions of votes. It's also clear, and I will say it in front of this camera, it's also clear that the UKIP vote is a very legitimate vote. It is a very legitimate vote against the utter failure of those um, no good politicians down there at Westminster. It is a very legitimate vote. It is a very legitimate vote against the, the failure for decades of the various governments, Labour governments, Tory governments, Liberal Democrat governments, makes no difference. A very legitimate vote against what's the, a very legitimate a very legitimate vote against the old gang at Westminster. A very legitimate vote that we nationalists have nurtured and built up for some forty years now. Yes. Ever since the days of the National Front of the 1970s, and I know there's at least two of us in this room who are very active in that party. Uh, ever since the days of the 1970s National Front, we nationalists have gone to the people, we have campaigned, um, we have campaigned in elections, we've gone to the street, we've had demonstrations, and we have campaigned on crime, on immigration, on the, de on the deliberate destruction of the British industry, <coughs> on the outsourcing of our jobs to the cheap labour countries of the Far East. We have, we have campaigned on the, uh, uh, the surrender of our, of, our, of our sovereignty to the European Union, and we have campaigned on a problem which many people still don't understand how dangerous, how dangerous is the enormous debt, the enormous and increasing debt that the British government had has piled up over these decades, a debt which will be a burden to future generations. Um, We've campaigned on this, and let it be said, we have campaigned for 40 years, because that is when we, when, when, when we went into politics and learned to cut our teeth, that's when we went into it. We have campaigned for 40 years, and I think you will agree with me that we can now see that there is a different, more sceptical, healthy attitude amongst the British people. Um, <coughs> there has been too many broken promises from the politicians, too many lies, too many wicked and shameful cover-ups. You know, at the moment they're talking about Rotherham, but that, that the crime of Rotherham has been committed right across these northern towns. Yes. I see that a lot more um, um, Asians have now been charged in Newcastle. So all the focus on just one town, Rotherham, wicked that it was. <coughs> 1,400 girls over a 12-year period, with it known to the authorities. This, I think now, 
I remember when I was in the 70s, I used to work in this big London office and people were patronising to, to me. They had obviously got advi advi admired me uh, um, my activism and all that, but they were patronising, particularly when Margaret Thatcher came along, they said, oh, we don't need your little party, Richard. Um, you know, Maggie Thatcher's going to solve all those problems. Well, I think now that the British people are realising that it's way, 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 way beyond all that. And what gives me heart, because like others in this room, I'm not just simply, I have learned over the years, I've expanded my interest from Britain, I am now as much, in, I am almost as much interested in what happens in France and Germany, the United States of America, as I am as what's happening to us in Britain. And I take the point from Michael that perhaps, peeps, perhaps some people should call themselves not national socialists, but racial socialists. And the, the, the young lady who gave, gave the talk at the beginning, um, Ben Classen's, Ben Classen's whole thought was how do we save the white race? How do we put some gumption and energy back into the white race? We are a minority in this world, as Ben Classen was forever reminding us. We're a minority and we're, a, we're losing everything. So, um, this, this new healthy sceptical mood isn't just taking place in Britain, it is taking place on the continent. Um, most, most welcome that in Germany, in Dresden, week after week after week in Dresden, there are huge um, uh, demonstrations against um, third world immigration and against the Muslim takeover in Europe. And it's interesting, they call themselves Pegida, that is um, the pan-European movement against uh, the Islamic takeover of Europe. Pan-European, they're not just German nationalists, they understand the danger to, to France and to Britain, to Sweden, to Holland, yeah, yeah. to Spain, as much as to Germany. And that is a, a very healthy sign that they think like that. It's also most heartening um, that, um, that in France, the Front National uh, is doing so well. Marine Le Pen is now um, the most favoured um, politician in France, her positive um, ratings as Marine Le Pen, um, leader of the Front National, is higher than the socialist Sarkozy, the socialist of Hollande, president, higher than the former uh, president, Sarkozy. She has the highest rating, M Marine Le Pen. In last year's Euro elections, Marine Le Pen's party got more votes and more Euro MPs elected than any other party in France. So, we are now starting to live in very interesting times. Also very interesting, and this may be tomorrow's <coughs> news, to maybe tomorrow's news elsewhere. In Greece, um, there's been a political tsunami, and the old gang has been wiped out in Greece, absolutely wiped out. Very interesting, I think, and a lesson for all of us, that um, <coughs> one of the first people to congratulate this new Syriza government, which of course is their Trotskyites, we know who exactly who they are, but one of the first people to congratulate the Syriza government was Marine Le Pen. Because she said the priority's got to be, the priority's got, she said, I disagree with your open immigrate, open door immigration policies, of course she's going to say that. But she said, we've got to get rid of the old gang. Yeah, we've yeah. got to get rid of the old gang. <laughs> and indeed, and it shows, um, shows the maturity of these guys and the strength of them. The leaders of Golden Dawn, who've now spent 12 months without, without appearing in court yet, <laughs> jailed by the former, um, the former so-called conservative government of Greece. The leaders of Golden Dawn in, um, in, in Greece also congratulated Syriza, which showed tremendous uh, bro bro broadness of mind, doesn't it? And the slogan is, we've got to get rid, we've got to get rid of these, um, we've got to get rid of this old gang. So, we, uh, yes, um, we have campaigned for years, um, we have campaigned um, for years, us nationalists, um, yeah, let me have a look. I, I got so distracted talking about Marine Le Pen. She's a, <laughs> she's a great type, there's no doubt about it. Um, oh, look, I'm looking on my paperwork now. Oh, dear. Um, uh, yeah, 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 we certainly warn the British people. Yes, so in this context, sorry about that, I got so distracted thinking about Marine Le Pen. Oh, she's a gutsy woman, right? She's gutsy. You know, most admirable. Most admirable. I tell you, we are not another gutsy woman. I keep going off into tangents here. Um, Pauline Hanson, another brave woman. And what, did they, what did they do? They keep saying about her, she ran a chip, fish and chip shop. What's wrong with fish and chips? Eh? Yeah. What's wrong with fish and chips? Uh, uh, snobs, and they put her in jail. They put her in jail. <laughs> they put her in jail. Another brave woman. A brave, uh, uh, most admirable people who stand. Anybody who stands up in this wicked age and sticks their neck above the uh, above the parapet is uh, most worthy. Most worthy. Most worthy. Um, I'm talking about Pauline Hanson. I've gone off the, the trail again. Yes. Okay. Yes. So. Yes. In this context. In this context of, of tsunamis sweeping um, corruption away, the UKIP vote in this context 
is a, a very welcome phenomenon, a very welcome phenomenon. But there's always a fly in the ointment in this world, there's always a but, and there's a very, very serious but with UKIP. UKIP's leadership, Farage, absolutely endorses, absolutely endorses the one world agenda. Farage believes um, in globalization, he believes um, in free trade, free trade, which means st goods produced for Tuttons Hating an Hour in China can knock out and destroy our, or destroy all our economy. <coughs> Farage believes in free trade. Farage believes in, in the right of the City of London to, to invest our capital, our money, money made in Britain, our capital, not in Britain, building up Britain. Farage believes in the right of the City of London, the finance houses of the City of London, to invest our capital in the cheap labour countries of the Far East, our deadliest competitors. And again, it was Margaret Thatcher, Margaret Thatcher, in tandem with um, President Reagan in the United States of America, who, who so-called liberalised um, the laws permitting the City of London in Britain to, um, to invest billions of our money, running into trillions in China, and in the same, uh, in the same sense, um, the American uh, uh, Wall Street was permitted uh, by Reagan at the same time in the 1980s to invest billions to such an extent, to such an amazing extent, that now China, by some measures, is the number one economic power in the world. Britain, Britain and America have invested so much money in China that now China, where they work for pennies in the pound, <coughs> from cents, cents, cents in the dollar, that China is in some measures the, the the, the greatest economic power in the world, built up by Wall Street and the City of London. Very, very dangerous situation. One could give a whole talk, one could give several talks about the dangers of the deliberate destruction of our industry and in parallel um, the de deliberate destruction of uh, American uh, economy and American industry. I'll just give you two names here. Um, if you want to, to um, follow um, the deliberate betrayal of particularly American industry and American, the American economy and the deliberate building up of China with vast investments in brand new state-of-the-art factories in greenfield sites in uh, China. If you want to study that particular aspect of globalization, then you should read um, the blogs of Pat Buchanan and Paul Craig Roberts. Paul Craig Roberts was a former um, member of uh, Reagan's uh, uh, Treasury Department. He was number two in the Treasury Department. He is now totally against the system. He writes a very interesting blog. Um, Paul Craig, Paul Craig Roberts, and the other man, Pat Buchanan. Um, again, he was a, 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 an, a, an advisor to various um, Republican presidents, Nixon and Reagan. Um, Pat Buchanan absolutely attacks the present regime in America as total open traitors, particularly the way that Wall Street has um, just de-industrialized America. Um, Pat Buchanan, I don't want to spend all afternoon talking about Pat Buchanan, he's a very brave and educated man. Um, Pat Buchanan, I'll just say two things about Buchanan, so you get the flavor, so you get the flavor of Pat Buchanan. Um, Pat Buchanan um, is a sort of, in a way, in a way, not strictly speaking a nationalist in our sense, he's not a sort of nationalist in our sense, he could compare him to Enoch Powell, I think, actually. He's that sort of guy. He's an old-fashioned conservative, of an old-fashioned, but a very, uh, a very worthy and honourable man. And just to give you a flavour of Pat Buchanan, and what a, a gutsy, not to say controversial man he is, um, he, uh, he is very critical. He says the Jewish influence in America is very, very strong, what with AIPAC and all that, the American-Israeli Public Affairs Committee. American-Israeli. You notice American's the adjective and Israeli's the noun. For those who take an interest in grammar, that is. Um, so, um, and he, 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 he once stood, Pat Buchanan stood as a, a presidential candidate back in the uh, 90s sometime, and he caused furore by saying, um, Washington, he says, Washington, D.C., he says, why, he says. That's Israeli occupied territory. He took quite a bit of stick for saying that. He's a brave man. He believes in controversies. Um, so, um, but coming back to um, coming back to the nitty gritty of where we are, the coming general election, where UKIP is going to do very, very well, and how does that? Um, how do we fit into that? Just the last ingredient of Mr. Um, um, Nigel Farage, um, Euro MP, of course has been a Euro MP for several years now, just to dot the I's and cross the I's, cross, dot the I's of immigration. Um, Andrew Bronze, who produced his excellent booklet, didn't waste his time as a Euro MP. Andrew Bronze used his um, um, presence in the, in the, pres in the uh, Parliament, the European Parliament, to cross-examine his fellow, Euro, fellow um, Euro MP, Nigel Farage, and said to Mr Farage, Mr Farage, where does your party stand on immigration? Yes or no? Are you for immigration or against immigration, Mr Farage? And Mr Farage, being a polite chap, said, um, all down here, 
thank you, thank you very much for your question, very polite, you see, thank you very much. Let us make this clear, so, it's coming to you, let us make this clear. UKIP is not against immigration, we welcome immigration, we want immigration. Yeah. So, so there you are, there you are. So that leaves, that leaves the British people with a political problem. And we, luckily for the British people, they've got us. They're very, very lucky, and they are lucky in the sense that we're lucky that we've got a wonderful country like Britain. Because we go together, like man and woman, man and wife, and all that sort of thing. Yeah, go together. Um, so, now you shall derail myself. <laughs> Thinking about men and women has derailed me. Um, Salt and vinegar, Richard. No, no, all right, don't, don't, that'll make me turn off the rails even more. Um, yes, yes. We snuck it off. Yeah, yeah, right. So, yes, the British, the British people have now got a political problem. They're going to vote in their millions for this. And they're lucky they've got us. Because some of the older us, the older ones that are in this room, who've been in this business a long, long time, We've been here before. We've been here before. We had our party, the National Front in the 1970s. We campaigned on crime and immigration. We learnt to go to the British people. And we built up, in the 1970s, we were building up a party very successfully. We caught the imagination of the British people. Whether it was Bradford or Leeds, or parts of London, or parts of the West Midlands, or parts of South Wales, or parts of um, the west coast of Glasgow and Edinburgh. We caught the imagination of the British people, and you, we, we, I think we would be entitled to say of ourselves, back in the 1970s, as the 70s came to an end, and we were all facing that then key general election of 1979, I think it could be said that we nationalists of the National Front were speaking for the British people, whether it's South London, or Birmingham, or Bradford, or those little towns, Rochdale, we spoke, and, and how did the authorities, how did the, uh, the political class react to us, including the City of London? They produced... Margaret Thatcher. In the run-up to that 1979 general election, which was a key general election of those years, Margaret Thatcher went on the television, prime time, and she spoke heart to heart to the British people. It was very well orchestrated, and she'd been given lessons, it came out later, she'd been given lessons by a top BBC producer how to present herself in front of a camera. And to cut a long story short, she assured the British people, we Tories intend control checking or controlling immigration, we intend doing something about, we intend dealing with the European Union, and we intend putting British people, Britain first. And then came the, then came the key moment, what the whole thing was aiming at, her, her notorious, her notorious swamping speech, when she looked the viewers, millions of viewers, straight in the eye and said, we Conservatives understand the fears of the British people are being swamped by alien cultures. She knew exactly what she was doing. I tell you, amongst themselves, the politicians, they've got a phrase for that. They call it playing the race card. Playing the race card. They know exactly what they're doing. They also call it campaign rhetoric. Campaign rhetoric. They don't mean a word of it. She played the race card. And she got herself elected into, into, into office. And number 10. And, uh, and they got to power the Tories. And I tell you, ladies and gentlemen, the Margaret Thatcher years were very lean years for us nationalists. But we kept the movement alive because we knew that it would all end in tears. And of course, it eventually did end all in tears. Um, and I will tell you, I will now um, foresee and prophesy the future for you, which is relatively easy for me, because I know exactly how this is going to play out, because I've seen it all before. <laughs> That's the advantage. If you, if, you, if you have a certain amount of longevity in this business, it all goes around and comes around. So you, can, you, can, you can almost write these creep speeches for them. You can know exactly what they're going to say. I'm going to give you a swamping speech. My name's whatever it is. Clegg or Cameron or some bloody name. Excuse me, I didn't mean to swear. Perhaps you knocked that out. Um, so, um, you know, I keep going off on tangents here. Um, so, um, yes, we've been here before. We, uh, we, we, we yes, the, 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 yes, the Thatcher Lee years were very lean years for us, but we kept the show, we kept the, show, we kept the movement alive because we knew that it would end in tears, which it certainly did. And I can prophesy to you that the, 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 uh, the UKIP Farage thing will end in tears, and I don't think, I don't think this time we're going to have to wait so long either. I don't think we're going to have to wait so long either. Because back in 79, the big populist, popular protest vote went to a politician who was part of the system went to an establishment politician, Margaret Thatcher of the Tory party, and this time, and that's what's so interesting about these days that we're living in, the big popular populist protest vote is going to a maverick party whose leader is essentially an outsider nobody. I will say to you finally, I'll, finally I'll say to you, 
there are very stormy times coming to this country. Very stormy times. <coughs> and very stormy times are coming to certainly the whole white race. And I don't want to dwell too much on what happened to that Jordanian pilot the other day. But we all live on the surface of the same globe, actually. And, uh, well, we've had a taste of that when, in Woolwich last year when a British soldier hacked down. We live in very stormy times. I'll just use that phrase. But I will say to you now that if we all stick together and maintain discipline, um, we, will, we can make use of this UKIP phenomenon. We can ride the UKIP phenomenon because UKIP will not and cannot um, deliver and, and the future is ours. Thank you very much. Yeah. Questions for Richard at all? No, there's no questions. <laughs> oh, there is one. Sorry. There's a comment, really. You you said quite rightly that at the 1979 election, the National Front uh, was speaking for the British people. Uh, if my reflection is right, uh, the New Statesman, just after the election, carried out a survey, or possibly they carried out the survey before the election and published it after the election. Uh, and they did almost a tick list of uh, the attitude of the British public on a number of issues. And then they added up the number of ticks, a bit crudely, and they found that the parties whose policies were most popular with the British people was the National Front. Mm, yeah. uh, but of course, uh, you know, that didn't mean that the National Front <laughs> was the most popular, yeah, or indeed. Yeah, was they it? expressed yeah. that one as well. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I mean, one other thing about UKIP is that, <clears throat> as you rightly say, Farage is utterly corrupt, a member of the political class. But I think many of their members, especially their new members, are not. They're people who would otherwise have joined a nationalist party had UKIP not been built up. So I think that UKIP carries fault lines within it. And I think what we need to be in a position for in maybe a year's time, 18 months' time, is to pick up the pieces. Uh, if we are so fragmented and we haven't got anything to pick up those pieces, then we'll lose the opportunity of the century. Thanks. Uh, two things. First of all, everything you said was music to my ears. Um, but there are two things that I think could be said um, in, in uh, corollary to them. One is uh, we should begin to rethink the whole idea of we want to get out of Europe. It's been absolutely fundamental to the nationalism, going back to the National Front, that the EU's a bad thing, we want to get out of it. But we, as, as you've already drawn attention, a lot of us now think in terms of a European racial nationalism or a, a wider white nationalism. So is this the time to detach ourselves from our natural allies? Again, Farage is against immigration, but only when it's white Christian immigration from the continent. He's perfectly happy with third world immigration from Africa and Asia, because that's part of the global breaking down the British people's strategy, which of course suits his global capitalist masters. Um, so we want to be, I think, rethinking whether it's in our interests to essentially sound like UKIP. There's that old joke by Constant Lambert, the, um, the musician, saying, never base your symphony on a folk song, because once you've played through the melody once, all you can do is play it through again louder. Um, we don't want to sound just like UKIP, only louder. We have to have a distinctive policy, and ours is surely to say we're against the EU in its present form, but not against Europe or Europeans. We actually see them as our kith and kin, and if it weren't for white immigration from Poland and Latvia and everywhere else in Europe, um, there would be even fewer compared with the African nations in the next generation than we're going to be anyway. So perhaps we should be welcoming with open arms as um, kindred genes. Uh, but what we have to do is to say that that doesn't mean to say we go along with everything that's uh, tied up with Brussels, with its undemocratic constitution. Liz, so, I'm sorry. If I just finish. The second point is watch India like a hawk. Hindu Muslim tensions are rising by the minute. Unfortunately, there's also a spillover in violence against Christians. You may have read that five churches in Delhi were sacked the other day. But the common factor is rising Hindu nationalism. 80% of Indians are still Hindu, only 13% are Muslim. Narendra Modi was, of course, banned from visiting the states because while he was Prime Minister of Gujarat, 2,000 Muslims were uh, massacred a few years back. Um, it is highly likely that at some stage there will be communal violence between Hindus and Muslims, started by the Hindus, uh, cracking down on the Muslims, who, after all, they never invited into India in the first place um, back in the 11th century. So there have been continuous tensions since then. The only difference is, instead of reading about it on the front page of the Times, you might actually see it happening on the street next to you. Because the Indian, the politics, the, co the communitarian politics of the Indian subcontinent are now at home in Birmingham and Bradford and Rochdale and Southall. And if things kick off in India, it is hard to believe they will not kick off in every Indian diaspora community 
in the world, and that will then bring in the Pakistanis on the side of the Indian Muslims, etc., etc. And none of our politicians have ever actually thought to consider that when these people moved in, among their cultural baggage was their ancestral hatreds of each other. It was assumed these sort of things would just evaporate with the second and third generation. But if you look at second and third generation nations in a sample and so on, they're originally divided into Hindus, Muslims, and Sikhs. They don't frequent each other's company. So it's hard to believe that what happens in the Indian subcontinent isn't going to have a direct influence in Britain. And when that happens, we'll be in a position to say, well, we told you this was going to happen. It's not exactly rocket science to say if you import people that can't stand the sight of each other, sooner or later things will kick off. <laughs> well, they will kick off, as you said. As you said and when <coughs> we'll be the only people that can say, we warned you about this, but you wouldn't listen. Well, maybe you can see with the sights of your own eyes what's happening on TV tonight in Birmingham, etc. Okay, Jez. Yes, um, all one needs to know about Thatcher's swamp speech is that it was proposed, planned and written by her Jewish handler, Alfred Sherman. Sir Alfred Sherman, yeah. and he Sir later was in no, Noble. One more question, and that's... Uh, sorry, Richard, what, what are you going to say there? Uh, yes, thank you, Liam. Oh, I'd like to respond to briefly to what, um, right. what Jim just said. Then it's Mike after you. Okay. okay. Um, just, uh, it's obvious... Well, from my perspective, this is now a white man's fight. I take that as granted. Um, but, of course, we're British. We understand Britain, and our responsibilities are here, mm. which is why we're British nationalists, and some of us, me, are also white nationalists. I just wanted to give myself a little plug here, because I'm just a modest chap. But two weeks ago, I was in Germany with um, Peter Rushton and Lady Ruth, <coughs> and our good friend, because he's our good friend, Peter Rushton, was not only in Germany with me two weeks ago, he's back on the continent this week as well. So there's the real personal link-ups. Thank you for listening to me. <laughs> okay, uh, Mike. I'm sorry, this is sort of um, I just wanted to um, ask about the, what Richard, what do you think about perhaps the unknown quantity, which is Vladimir Putin? Because I understand that once, um, if you get forced a, a referendum onto the unwilling establishment, uh, that one of the scare stories will be, oh, well, we've got to get together, we've got to you, you, you unite with Europe um, in order to resist this terrible monster called Vladimir Putin. I wonder if you have any Well, to... if I'm invited to say a few words on that, Ivan and I were discussing Putin during the break. And I just said that um, I hope this weekend you might know that um, President Hollande, whatever you think of him, and Angela Merkel, whatever you think of her, um, are negotiating with Putin in an attempt, it seems, to stop this war in the Ukraine, which strikes me as a very, very dangerous war, which could have all sorts of dangerous problems. As for Putin, he is a bit of a mystery man, but he's obviously a brave man, and he's, he's clearly, I would say this of Putin, you've got to be very careful with Putin, Putin is a Russian patriot. But Russia isn't quite the same kind of country, or Germany, Britain, or France. Russia, you could, you could talk hours about Russia. Russia is, was, and still is an empire formed by the Tsars, which includes a lot of Muslim peoples who are native to that area. And Putin does represent those, he, he seems to accept the Muslims, who, who were accepted, first of all, by Tsar um, Ivan the Terrible, back at the time of Elizabeth I. And that is part and parcel that the Russians are hard to understand. They're, the Russians themselves are certainly Europeans, but they had this strong um, Muslim input. Um, for example, who knows this? I'll just beg your question, beg, beg you. What We know about the Muslim problem in Europe, yes? Here's a question for you. What city in Europe has got the most Muslims in it? Moscow. What? Moscow. That's correct, Moscow. Two million. Honestly. Moscow has got two million Muslims. And when the Soviet Union was it, when the Soviet, when the Soviet Union, more than, more than Paris, more than Marseille, more than Cologne, more than Bradford, <coughs> when the Soviet Union was in existence, you had to live in your very large region. You couldn't move around. But when the Soviet Union collapsed, everything collapsed. And two million Muslims, mostly Tatars from Tatarstan, which is only about 300 miles to the east of, of Moscow in the Urals, flooded into... They have huge social problems in Moscow with two million Muslims. Now, Putin just ignores all that. What ethnicity are they? What? Tatars. From Tatars. 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 Russia is a very, all I'm trying to say here, all I'm trying to say, Russia is a very complicated country, Putin represents Russia, and Russia isn't, strictly speaking, a European city, strictly as Britain, France, Holland, or whatever or Ireland is. It's a very, so, I don't know, I don't know how to answer your question, is what I'm trying to say. <laughs> Thank you for your patience. Okay, Steve Frost. Yeah, Richard, uh, enjoyed that. And if I can just swing it back to uh, UK focused, um, not particularly UKIP, because I think UKIP is just a stalking horse. Um, I believe, and I don't know whether you agree with this or not, that the political establishment that we have at the moment, the status quo, has run its course. But the old gang won't accept that. Conversations I've had with people who live north of Adrian's Wall are under the impression that the Labour vote is going to collapse 
across Scotland, uh, as is the uh, Lib Dem vote, the SNP are going to ride on the back of last year's referendum. Devastate Labour. Miliband and his cohorts cannot gain overall UK power without the traditional Scottish bloc of MPs. If UK wrecks that, Miliband has no power at all. He, he, what he's got in England <coughs> and Wales won't give him enough swing to dominate. We may end up with a hung parliament. Obviously, there's going to be the fringes coming in. UKIP, I think, will get a few seats. The Greens may get a couple. And it will be a very mixed bag. But, and this is, this is the key, this is what stinks in what we term democracy in this country. The status quo, the establishment, are very comfortable with the rotating Tory Labour dictatorship. Mm. Would you agree that if it is likely that the status quo is going to be damaged too much, the state behind the scenes will intervene with the election? I was talking to somebody yesterday who told me about seeing stacks and stacks of BMP votes at the height of the BMP disappearing in the, uh, in the counting halls. Mm -hmm. And the likelihood is that people were disappearing those votes particularly counters who were affiliated to the Labour Party and to the left, and that the shredders worked overtime in town halls later. I suspect in the days of the heyday, Andrew of the National Front, similar things happened. I do not believe that given the corrupt state of our establishment, and I mean not just the two political parties, but the whole power block, the same corrupt forces that concealed all the child abuse at Westminster and so on, are going to stand back and see their gravy train taken away from them. Would not. you agree that they m may well use the forces of the secret state to interfere with the electoral process? Well, uh, if I'm to answer that, uh, 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 my guess at the general election, OK, I'll give you my guess. <coughs> yes, in Scotland, the SNP is going to wipe out Labour. But I have read that, that, might, all, that all that might mean is that Miliband forms a coalition government with the Scottish nationalists at Westminster. Yes. Then you'd have left wing plus left left wing, and that really would be a nasty combination. The, the other scenario I've seen is that there'll be a coalition, as there is in Germany at the moment, between socialists and so-called conservatives. That Miliband will go into a coalition with the uh, with uh, with uh, with Cameron or, or some top of, or some Tory replacement. I think this system in Britain. Britain is the centre of liberalism, it is the centre of internationalism, the city of London for a long time. They can, they can keep this going quite a long time. And I'll just say one my final word. Outside some very, very bad Asian parts of British cities, I don't actually think that they fiddle the ballot papers. I might be regarded as fantastically naive for saying that. But if they fiddle them, I don't think that man over there would have been a European Parliament for a Nationalist Party, nor, nor his then colleague at the time. They wouldn't have got there. If, and we wouldn't have had 12 councillors in Dagenham. And the BNP at one time had 100, 100 councillors. So outside bad areas, I don't think they do it. And, and, and I'm agreeing with you now, um, Steve. I don't think they need to do it because they can fiddle it. They can fiddle it. And just watch. I'm sure that Labour will be wiped out in Scotland. And then hunky chunky, they'll do a deal in Westminster, and it'll be smiley smart. Anyway, that's my that's my contribution. Thank you for that. Okay, well, I've got a gentleman here. Um, he's a friend of mine. He's a fellow called Alex Suchi, and he's got just a few words to uh, announce to the audience here. Um, he's a traditionalist, and he's he's a nationalist, and um, he's a all-round good guy. So, oh, well done. 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 Well done.